Welcome to the Bible-Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace, where we are endeavoring to grow, know, and love God more in 2024. Here are your announcements. Bible-Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace recognizes our living legend, Sister Bernice Willis. She is a retired registered nurse, a professional singer and performer. In 2018, she published her first collection of poems entitled A Little Book with Big Inspiration. In 2019, she published another book, Poetic Expressions, My Love to the World. And in 2023, she published the book with many flavors, Taste and see. She also actively serves here at the Bible Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace. Bible Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace recognizes another one of our living legends, the Reverend Dr. Fanny Green Lemons. For 26 years, Dr. Fanny Green Lemon serves as a professor at the Theater Performance Faculty at the University of South Florida teaching voice, speech, dialects for actors, playwriting, solo and duet performance, audition workshops at all levels in the USF Acting Studio. She is also taught as a faculty member at the Juilliard Drama School in New York City, the New Hampshire Academy for Dramatic Arts, the Actors Center in New York City, and the Yale University School of Drama. Professionally, she has directed and performed in many plays in Florida and across the United States. Over the course of her acting career, Dr. Green Lemons performed in the TV show Special Victims Unit. She also received credit as an actor in the historic play Mule Bone by Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes on Broadway in New York City. Additionally, she has performed as a voice actor in The Heart and Soul of Tampa Bay. She is also a published author. Some of her published writings include her play, What the Heart Remembers, The Women and Children of Darfur, which she also directed. Now is Not the Time for Silence, a book chapter about the power of creativity and most recently, her authored short story, Tillers. In addition to serving for a number of years as an ordained reverend by Pastor Mason, she has served in many ministries. Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace honors our icon, Ms. Shirley. She was an example of serving God with her whole heart. She was a dedicated member of the dance team, and she participated in soul winning and our church cleanups. Let's remember Ms. Shirley. The Bible Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace, celebrating our 26th church anniversary. Pray for our church. Pray for our country. Pray for our people. Pray for peace. Pray for our families. Pray for our government. Pray, pray, pray. Join the prayer ministry as they lead us in prayer around our property and the surrounding neighborhood on Saturday, April 27th, beginning at 9 a.m. Join us on Sunday, April 28th at 8 a.m. for our 26th church anniversary worship service. Our guest preacher will be the Reverend Larry Roundtree II, pastor of the New Mount Zion Baptist Church. 
Join us on Sunday, April 28th, immediately following our 8 a.m. worship service in the Fellowship Hall for Ministries on Parade. There will be games, food, and prizes. Get to know our ministries. Learn more about what they do and find a place to serve as we continue to grow, know, and love God more. The Bible says we are to pray one for another. Please pray for our members and friends listed here. Good morning, Bible Bills. How are you this morning? Are you glad to be here? Yes, it's always a pleasure. It's always a blessing to find yourself in the house of the Lord. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, please. Will you bow your heads with me? Most gracious, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We come with thankful hearts. 
we come thanking you for your many blessings. You woke us up this morning, Heavenly Father. You started us on our way. And we are so blessed to be here. Heavenly Father, I come this morning asking your blessings upon our sick. Let them know that you are truly a healer. Let their faith stay strong. Let them call on you. And Heavenly Father, forgive us of our sins. Those things that we are guilty of that are not pleasing in your sight. Help us to seek you each and every day of our lives. Help us to enjoy and desire to be in your presence. For when we are in your presence, we are blessed. Heavenly Father, continue to bless the shepherd of this house, the one that you have placed over us. Continue to give him the strength, the courage, and all that he needs to continue to bless us. Now let your Holy Spirit be with us this morning as we worship and praise you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, Bible Base. Good morning, Bible Base. It's another day that the Lord has made, and we've come this morning to rejoice and to be glad about it. The God that we serve is a holy God. He's a faithful God. He's powerful. There's no other God like the God that we serve. So we can sing, holy Lord, you are holy. There's none like you. You are holy, holy, you are holy, great and mighty, great and mighty Lord. You are holy, holy, you are holy, great and mighty, great and mighty. There is none like you, nobody, nobody anywhere, none like you, nobody. Nobody, nobody else, you are holy, you are holy, great and mighty, you are holy, holy, you are holy, great and mighty, there is none like you, nobody, 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 You are faithful, faithful. You are faithful. Great and mighty, great and mighty Lord. You're so faithful, faithful. You are faithful, great and mighty, great and mighty. There is none like you, none like you. Nobody, nobody anywhere, none like you. Nobody, nobody anywhere, none like you. Nobody, nobody anywhere, nobody, nobody, nobody else, nobody else like you. You're so powerful. You are 
are powerful. And 
stop clapping don't stop clapping when you come to a place that you know you're standing on holy ground then you can bring everything to the lord you can confess some things you can ask for forgiveness you can tell him all about it when you're standing on holy ground and we and we know check this and we know that there are angels all around that's reason for us to lift up our hands and say god i bless you you've been mighty mighty good there's nothing too hard for you god and i know i'm standing on holy ground i'm serving a holy god he's addressing my life in all the situations that i face i give him praise i glorify his name i lift him up because he's been just that good we're standing on holy ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Has God done anything for you this week? Did he wake you up this morning and get you started on your way? Were there any questions that went unanswered and you took them to the Lord in prayer and he addressed those situations? The choir said we standing on holy ground and there are angels all around. We're standing on holy ground and there are angels all around. That's reason for me to bless his name. That's reason for me to pray for him. Hallelujah. 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 God, I bless you. I love you. I magnify you. Hallelujah. I'm standing on holy ground. Nothing too hard for God. On holy, on holy yeah. Hallelujah. We bless your name, God. Thank you for another day to come and worship you. Thank you for another day to come together in fellowship and give you praise. Hallelujah. Good morning, Bible Base. We're so glad to see you here, and we're glad that those of you who are joining us on, uh, on one of our uh, online platforms, thank you for joining with us. 
We're located in Tampa, Florida, and we certainly want to make sure that you come and visit us and see us face to face. Do we have anybody here in the sanctuary who's visiting with us for the first time? Let me see. Raise your hand. If that's you, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hallelujah. We take this opportunity to say welcome to you, and we're so glad you chose to come here to Bible Age. to Bible. Once again, we're so glad that you've joined with us this morning, and we are excited to know that God is doing great things in your life, and that by coming to Bible Base, we know that you're coming by faith to believe that God is doing great things in you. And so we bless the Lord for your presence. We have this vision statement that we recite. Now, our vision statement sets direction for our church and has been doing it for guess how many years? 26 years. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Especially because we are around and surrounded by churches that in some cases, unfortunately, doors are closing. Never sustained 26 years. And guess what? The Lord has been just so good to us. We've had the same pastor for 26 years. That's good news. That's the Lord's doing and we can give him glory for that. So let's recite. Our, our vision statement together. Let's do it loudly and robustly. The Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace will reach and reproduce within the Tampa Bay and Temple Terrace areas and its surrounding communities. A people inspired, equipped with the passion for the truth of Christ and his compassion for others, who will be enablers of change for the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. We are Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-led, extending God's kingdom biblically, evangelistically, educationally, entrepreneurially, through expansion, economically, politically, socially, and globally. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Did anybody come to worship him this morning? Did anybody come to give him praise? Hallelujah. I love you forever with all my heart. I
forever you're my king. Come on and help me say I love you. I love you forever. again. I love you. I love you forever. Forever. With all my heart. With all my heart. With all my heart. See you, King. Yeah. Well, whenever, whenever, whenever you talk about a king, you're not talking about just a regular local. 
you're talking about somebody that is very, 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 uh, people long to get to see their king. People long to be in the presence of their king. Even in a human life, when people are privileged to get to even see the king, uh, they count that a great privilege. But we who have a king who is never not near, uh, you missed it. There's never a reason not to be joyful. There's never a reason not to be celebrative. There's never a reason not to be foot stomping, hand clapping, lifting up the precious name of Jesus because when the king is near, healing is near. When the king is near, deliverance is near. When the king is near, I want to ask you to continue to be in prayer for the Lemons family uh, as they go through this season of... Uh, healing, um, and uh, other members of our family. This, it seems like there's just one wave after another. And it's always good to know that when the teaching keeps coming, the testing keeps coming so that God can let you see if the trusting keeps coming. What, what lesson are you learning? <clears throat> what lesson is God teaching you now in this season? For some of us, you've never been here. Uh, for others of us, you thought the last time was the worst time. But what lesson are you learning? The day you begin to believe that nothing happens to you without God's permission, you look at it differently. The day that you come to that place where you honestly believe that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, you'll look at whatever it is from a different vantage point. That's my word to you today is until you begin to look at life first vertically, you will not have the right appreciation horizontally nor internally. Until you can begin to see life through God's lens, that nothing catches him by surprise, that nothing escapes him, that nothing was a, oh my goodness, how, not for him. You and I find ourselves saying, dog, as if, if we had only known. It is at that moment that you forget God knew, God knows, God cares. See, you be singing these songs, they sound so pretty. I love you forever with all my heart. You should see you. When? Because when you sincerely, maybe you're trying to psych yourself into that. I love you forever. Forever you're my king. We Exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh Lord. 
we exalt thee. He's our king. We exalt thee. He's our king. We exalt thee. Oh, Lord. Then when you say that other song, I love you. Forever, it begins to take on a new meaning. With all my heart, you lost. <laughs> Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter. Four, I believe it is, chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to enjoy preaching this passage. I love preaching passages that the church is already familiar with. I, I love preaching passages when the amens, doesn't, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to order them. They, they, they just flow out of understanding and appreciation of the truth. Ephesians chapter 4. I just love passages like this because when you preach and teach passages that everybody has already uh, made themselves familiar, it is then that you don't have to worry about trying to come up with something brand spanking new. This is the Believer's Bank book, the book of Ephesians. Uh, written primarily to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus, that city, uh, that wealthy city, that city at one time was considered uh, the bank, uh, the location of the bank, the largest bank in the ancient world, Ephesus. Like uh, uh, when you talk about this book, it ought to just make you light up. You think about the church at Ephesus like a little island located right in the midst of the sea of paganism, surrounded by um, all kinds of ills all kinds of sins that church surrounded by all of the ills of society and God would have a man that he himself arrested on the Damascus road and from that day forward. That man has never sought opportunity to escape nor to be released from God's custody. Would you read with me verses 1 through 6 of Ephesians chapter 4? I'm reading from the King James Version on the screen. It's also the same. But I don't know if you ought to trust the screen because if Reverend Fanny and Dr. Jenny be reading the screen, I don't, I don't know what they be seeing. After 26 years, it ought to be down in, way, way, way down inside. She should do like them uh, real, she, like them real uh, teleprompter readers be doing and they get to the part they can't hardly see they go <clears throat> thank you Jesus <clears throat> thank you Jesus no they want to be cute ah, the Bible based fellowship church flowing with milk and honey no it's not there come on let's read together you, I, I, th I thought I could get some of that off for you but whatever it is that's for you don't shoot none of it up here alright 
Keep it to yourself. <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. In the endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Amen. Before you take your seat, would you tell your neighbor good morning? Would you tell him good morning again? Tell him, say, neighbor, this morning, with your prayers and God's help, the preacher's going to preach about it. Paul's plea for a worthy walk. Now, neighbor, he's, he's begging them. He's begging church folk to have a worthy walk. Take your seats in the presence of the Lord. You, you know, I've heard this passage in recent days taught and I've heard this passage over my 26 years in this church I've heard it preached but for the life of me I've not been able to figure out why it is that a preacher would have to beg the congregation to walk worthy. I, I, I've not been able to have an appreciation, but I mean congregations all over the world that have employees who understand the meaning and the purpose of the SOPs on the job. They know the they know the value of the SOPs and they know the responsibilities to the SOPs. I, when, a person, when a person joins an organization, that person obligates themselves to live and to act in accordance with the standards of the group. That person accepts that organization's aims, that organization's objectives, that organization's standards as their own. A citizen is obligated to abide by the laws of their own country. That employee that joins that workforce must follow the rules, adhere to the standards, understand the purpose and the purposes of that company. Members of service clubs obligate themselves to promote the goals of the club and to abide by its standards. When somebody joins an athletic team that, that somebody is obligated to play as the coach orders and according to the rules of that sport. Human society could not operate without such obligation. Because we as humans, we have a natural desire to be accepted and to belong and many people will go to almost any lengths to qualify for acceptance in a fraternal order, a social club, a sorority. Well, I guess I'm by myself. Is anybody in here a member of a sorority? And you know, you you know, you know, I know what I'm talking about. You, they put you out. 
Anybody in here in a fraternity? The FOP put you out? Ha! No. Well, I guess no wonder y'all couldn't respond to that. When somebody is a part of a group, you're obligated to follow that group's laws and standards. I, I've been a part of fraternities, but they were all for persons who have celebrated uh, at, uh, an academic level of, of that of an erudite. Uh, we didn't have to uh, do certain things to get in. We did certain things and they invited us in. We did certain things academically and they uh, sought us out to be a part. Now, now I, I did belong in high school to something called the Sir Debs. Hadn't figured out yet why. But while in there, we had certain colors we wore. We had certain chants that we had. In fact, we had a certain image we had to uphold and when everybody saw us, they expected us to be dressed like we were dressed, looking like we looked, sounding like we sound. They expected us to be at the top of our game all the time. We were called the Sir Dabs. I went on to college. Uh, I thought to join one of those uh, more advanced Divine Nine organizations that was all you could hear on the hill about the divine nine and it was most of what you always saw but they all had a different walk they all had a different talk they they had a different signal they had a different hoop they had they all had their own but you know what i found out they wouldn't tell me much they still won't but they they, they, they told me that they had to learn their history. They told me that they had to, to know how the organization began. They told me that they had to know uh, secrets and that they had songs and they had steps. And, and they liked to show off their steps. I mean, you're talking about this weekend in Dallas, Texas. They're having the world's biggest step show on the 12th and the 13th. You know it's gone, don't you? But I keep up with stuff like that because I keep trying to figure out how people could be so committed to that and how they could be so dedicated to that. How they can be so... I mean, some people will go through great lengths to keep from being rejected by those groups. I mean, they'll pay large, sum, pay large sums to, to participate. Um, the parents of um, a man in the Bible, a man who was born blind, they were afraid to tell the Jewish leaders that Jesus had healed their son because they were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue. You can read about that story in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. You don't want to believe me. And although they had seen the result of a miracle that had healed their own son of his lifelong blindness, they would not credit Jesus with the miracle for fear of being socially ostracized. They say, I don't know. He is of age. Ask him. All I could tell you is whereas I, he was blind. And now he sees. For the same reason, many even of the rulers believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. 
For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Sometimes as you sit there and you wonder, why is he telling us all of this? I wanted to wonder. I told you, for more than 26 years, I've wondered why a preacher, a pastor, a leader would have to beg members of the church to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And then, since you already know this passage, praise God, I'm so excited because the occasion of the writing is Paul has, in chapter 4 now, for the second time he has said to the recipients of this letter, I am the prisoner. You can check me out. He says it to him in chapter 3, verse 1, and he says it again here in chapter 4. And what is so marvelous about the repetition is that he doesn't want it to be unknown that his freedom is restricted. That his ability to go here and there to display his steps or to display his song or to let folks see how Paul looked after that Damascus Road experience. He wants them to know that he is in chains. And every time he moves his hand or moves his feet, those chains ring out a melody of I'm so glad. I'm in his hand. You see, what he does is he tells them, I, Paul, a prisoner. But he says, I am the prisoner. In chapter 3, he says, of the Lord Jesus. Here in chapter 4, you read it, you read it. He says, I am the prisoner. Saying to them, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not looking for release. I'm not looking to be uh, 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 pitied. I want you to take note of this fact that the Roman government, Roman soldiers, Nero, the governor, they blocked my path to going into hinder parts of Spain and Arabia and Antioch, and they blocked the road for me to spread the news about Jesus. But I am incarcerated not by them. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Translated, they blocked me from being able to go to churches and preach in pulpits, but God has held me in his care, under his control, in his custody, and what I couldn't do in the, in the parish or in the pulpit, I can do it from this prison with my pen. You're going to catch this before I leave here today? He says, I want you to understand that though I may be restricted in going around and demonstrating my walk, he says, I want you to know that I am still committed to the cause of Christ. I'm here because of you. I got arrested preaching and telling you about him. I'm here because he has chosen not only you, but he chose me. He called me. 
He constrained me. He's compelled me. I, I know you already know this passage, but would you just peer into this passage? Because when he says, I am the prisoner, he's saying, there's nothing man has done or can do to me to stop me from writing about the Savior of the world. And on top of that, I want you to know that these chains have been for me character cultivating chains. They taught me to look at life differently. They taught me to think about life differently. That being chained has taught me to give praise to the one who brought me. To give praise to the one who taught me. To give praise to the one who caught me and has kept me and has never left me. That even though I am in prison. Now if you want to learn about Paul's imprisonments and how they were effective and yet ineffective. That what man intended for him to do to him, they were ineffective. God's reasoning for allowing him to be. Did I tell y'all that nothing can't happen to you unless God allows it? Did I tell you that nothing can't happen to you that catches God by surprise? Paul's imprisonment by Nero. In fact, in fact Paul, Paul, let me tell you a little bit because you already know the story. He, he, in, in Acts chapter 15, he got arrested. And he was on some old trumped up charges. You know, he went to Jerusalem and he walked into the church and they arrested him. And then they put him in prison for two years. And Paul says, you know what? This makes no sense. You don't know what you're telling me with. You don't know when you're going to let me go. He says, I am a Roman citizen. He pulled rank on him. He says, and I'm appealing to the Caesar. I want to go to Rome. And on his way to Rome, he got shipwrecked. On his way to Rome, it looked like it was all over for him. But God showed up and he said, listen, you're going to be just fine. In fact, everybody going to be just fine. You're going to have to make it on broken pieces. But you're going to get there. And when he got there, they wasn't satisfied letting him go, so they sent him to his own house and put him in what Deacon White would call house arrest. And because he was on house arrest, he could have visitation. And because he was on house arrest, he could have someone like Tychicus to come and uh, take notes and, and, and be the delivery boy of this letter, e e Ephesians. To the church when he teaches. He may have also used uh, Onesimus because while he was in jail, he met this young dude, this runaway slave. He, he, he met this kid, led him to Christ. I mean, here's a Paul. When Paul says, I am a prisoner, he says, I never stopped witnessing. I've never stopped soul winning. I've never stopped praying. I never stopped praising. He says, they might have barred the way for me to travel, but they didn't bar the way for me getting to the throne of grace. I, this cause, bow my knees to the Father. Next time you read it, read it right. Get the story straight. You keep the story straight because he's not crying about how hard life is. And he says to the church, he says, I'm letting you know my condition of existence because I don't want you to think that I would ask you to do something that I have not done, am not doing. I might can't go in Rome, but I sure am committed to the cause no matter where I am. No matter how broke I am, no matter how hurting I am, no matter that I'm chained in some, in fact, I'm glad to be changed because every time I drop to my knees in prayer, 
that soldier got to drop to his knees right along with me. Every time I got to stand up and lift my hands to give praise, that soldier that's chained to me. Do you ever feel like that on your job or in your home that because you are so committed to the cause of Christ, whatever those around you are doing, they're doing it because they see you do it. They are tied. But I have not understood it's why a man in prison has more enthusiasm and more joy and more encouragement. I mean, he's really, uh, uh, Jackie, he is turned into a beggar. You know, when you and I hear the word beggar, we think of somebody broke. We think of somebody in tattered clothes. We think of somebody that's possibly homeless. We think of somebody that's possibly without a job. No, Paul wasn't that kind of beggar. Paul says, I beseech Parakaleo in the Greek. He says, I beg you. I urge you. Notice, notice, notice. He does not command. This is not a command. This is in the aorus active infinitive. And that don't let that run you because the teachers told me all of that hocus pocus, junky wonky that you had us going through Bible basics and how to teach, that was for you. Uh, Sister Alice Wright told me, you're trying to make us a college student. Well, hold it on. See, when you understand the syntax, when you understand uh, the morphology, when you understand how to treat the verb, you know, he wasn't saying, I demand. No, he's saying, I beg you. I beg you. I urge you. I plead with you. That word Paracaleo, uh, 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 Brother Thaxa Cooper, he, 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 he can relate to this word because I always think of him as being an attorney, as being a lawyer. Uh, this was a term that meant to call one alongside. Like calling a lawyer on your side to stand with you. Calling a lawyer on your side to represent you. Paul said, I beg you. Like begging a lawyer to come and stand with you. I beg you. Why does he have to beg church folk who are not in chains, who have the comfort and the freedom to roam Anywhere they wanted to roam. Well, in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul has set forth the believer's position with all the blessings, all the honors, all the privileges of a child of God. He has told them that they are rich. He's told them that this is what we believe, that this is our creed, that this is our faith, that this is our doctrine, that these chapters one, two, and three, these are our principles. He says, Therefore, based on that, based on the fact that you, God has adopted you, that God has accepted you, based on the fact that Christ has redeemed you, that God has chosen you, that before the foundation of the world, he handpicked you. He, 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 he that, that, that Paul says it like this, that those whom God had predestined. God Almighty. It's these folk that he says, therefore, since chapters one, two, and three is what we believe, he says, there's a correspondence to it called behavior. 
that since we believe this, behave like it. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most disheartening things I can tell you I've seen as a Christian and as a pastor is to see children of God out of balance, living lives so freely in contradiction to who they are. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 tells us who we are and what we have in Christ. It says that this is our creed. And so there has to be a corresponding conduct. He says this is our doctrine. This, this is what we teach. This is our teaching. This is our body of belief. So there's a corresponding deportment or duty. He says that this is our faith, then you got to function this way. He says, I've taken three chapters telling you how rich you are. He says, now I beg you to be responsible concerning those riches. I've taken chapters one, two, and three telling you who you are and what you have, telling you you're wealthy. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord, I beg you. See, see, he's not, he's not vacillating. He's not saying, well, I hope y'all will be thankful. And I hope you all will act like you appreciate what God has done for you. I, I hope you will. Uh, no, he, that's not. That is why, Bernice, I have to understand the morphology. I have to understand the, the language, I have to understand uh, uh, the, 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 the way to treat it so I won't think that he's demanding them. No, to the contrary. He is earnestly pleading with them. Literally, he's a beggar. He's begging them. You see, in the Old Testament, God... In the Old Testament, God says, you do this, I'll bless you. Yeah. He say, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith and see. I'll open the windows of heaven Pour out blessings you won't have room to receive. It's different in the New Testament. That's why people don't like me. It's because I read the Bible with a brain. I bring my brain to the Bible. And in the New Testament, God doesn't say, if you, then I. He says, since I, then you ought. Since I've blessed you in spite of you, since I looked beyond your faults and saw your knees, since I lifted you above the secular and the mundane, since, 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 Paul says, I'm begging you, to don't, to don't live a life in contradiction to the one you sing about in your song. <sighs> he says, God says, Old Testament, you do, I do. New Testament says, I've done. What you gonna do? And Paul says, I'll get them straight, Lord. Even in chains, I'll tell them upon the first day of the week that every man lay by him in store. It is no different than what was said in the Old Testament, except the Old Testament, the giving was predicated uh, to, for the blessing. In the New Testament, you've been blessing, you've been blessed, and you've been blessed. He says, now, I'm telling you, respond to the blessing. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, Old Testament. New Testament, upon the first day of the week, that every man lay by him in store. New Testament, 
He who soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who soweth bountifully shall of abundance reap. New Testament. Don't give grudgingly nor of necessity. Don't act like you're doing God a favor. God loves a cheerful giver. See how happy you could be sharing the word of God when everybody already know the scriptures. But you can't tell me why the preacher has to beg people whom God so loved that when God, God, and God assembled to talk about the plight of man. Man who, uh, Sister Ruth, um, um, the first sin was because of pride. I called Sister Ruth. Ruth Sister Ruth told me how much she loves the Proverbs. One of the Proverbs, two of the Proverbs, three of the Proverbs, those pithy statements they say some great stuff. That pride goeth before destruction. And there was this angel, I'm telling you, the best looking angel in glory. I'm telling you, there was this angel who was the leading angel. I'm telling you, angels were bowing before him when they shouldn't have been. In fact, he was so busy trying to be God. He said three times, I, I, I. And God says, no. Your pride has gotten you dethroned. And do you know that there were others that were still willing to follow him? And you get to see them every day because... I don't know what it is about pride, but that thing is so real until Paul had to plead with the Christians at the very top of the list to deal with your pride, to deal with self-awareness, after you have dealt with God awareness and Christ awareness, um, this week in morning manner, I think I'm going to detour a little bit and talk about humility. Because that's the one thing the world doesn't want us to have. And that's the one thing that got Satan kicked out. No, he was Lucifer then. <laughs> The son of the morning got him kicked out. And do you know every sin since then is always founded upon pride. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're going to do. It's all at the root of it. Is P R I D E pride. That every sin. One of the teachers were trying to figure out what I want you to know, what I want you to do, what I want you to see, how I want you to feel. I say, the day you get away from a, a limited and restricted diet. Then you can be free to feed as God feeds you, as the Holy Spirit gives you what to say. It might not be in the three points and then we're going home. No. Paul says that God favored you. That God graced you. That God showed you mercy that God opened the way for you by sending his son and he didn't send him 
dressed up in tuxedos. He sent him down in Bethlehem's barn, a stinking period. I, I, I went in it. I went in it. Manure everywhere. God sent his son down, all the way down. He descended all the way down to that. He himself declared, bird had nests, foxes had holes, but there was nowhere for the Son of Man to lay his head. And his whole life was kind of like that. He ate from another man's table. He drank from another man's well. His whole life was like that. He, he hung out there the other Friday for another man's sins. And he was buried in another man's tomb. Then he got up last Sunday for another man's joy. And clapping your hands is not what I beg you. I beg you. Doesn't cost you what it costs to be in the fraternity. Doesn't cost you what it costs you to be in the sorority. Doesn't cost you what it costs you to be in the fraternal order. Doesn't cost you but this worthy walk has characteristics. This worthy walk has a cause. This worthy walk, um, it does have a cost. But this worthy walk it also has compensation. It's how much do I owe the Lord for all he has done for me? Thought I was worth dying for? Thought I was worth keeping? Plato, I'm looking at your wife over there. I say, she coming whether you come or not. And there you go over there on your post. <laughs> My God. He thought I was worth dying for. What else has he done? Lauren, I can't tell it all. But if he never does anything else, I want you to know I could never repay him for what he's already done. So at least I can walk worthy. Now, what is this worthy thing? And I'm gone. Because that word, worthy, worthy is the Greek word axios, A-X-I-O-C-E. Sometimes they put an accent on it and another E. Just depends on what class you're in at the time. But what I love about that word axios is that in Paul's day, it was a bartering term that, that everything that they, they purchased, they... They use the scale to um, um, weigh out the value that uh, in Paul's day, they would take a scale and on one side, they would put um, what you are uh, intending to sell or buy. And on the other side, they'll put what the value is. And they would know that the value is right because they have a little needle or pendulum that once it's, it's balanced, that's the word I'm looking for, is axios, <laughs> means the balancing of the scales. That whatever you put on one side, in order to get the accurate value of it, you put it on the other side. You put the value on the other side. Um... You probably heard me tell this because my grandmama, my grandmother, 
she wasn't a walker. She didn't do no walking. She didn't have no um, dietitian. She didn't have nobody telling her what to eat and what not to eat. She didn't know, she had nobody telling her what to do. I'm still like my grandmama. If, but my grandmama ate everything, ate all of it, and uh, wore it. Uh, it is believed that she exceeded some 500, my, my 600 pound life. I don't know which one it is, but she was a huge grandmama. And my grandmama, she wasn't no college grad, but she knew how to count. She knew how to weigh stuff. And she would give me 20 cents. To go down there and tell Bartomato, that was the butcher, tell Bartomato to send me, um, sometimes she would say 20 cents worth of bologna. Sometimes she'll say, give me three pounds. Whatever it was, when I would go there and tell Bartomato what my grandmama say, Bartomato would wrap it up and send it back home. And I handed it my grandmama, she said, uh-uh. Go tell Bartomato to send me my other four slices of meat. <laughs> she understood the balancing of the scales. What has that to do with you and I? I'm so glad you asked. As Paul says, based on all of what I've told you in the first three chapters, of the book of Ephesians. Matter of fact, he says, if you want to see the parallel to all of this, would you jog, jog over to Romans chapter 12, verses 2, 3, and 4? He says, do it however you want to do it. Or would you just take the risk and run over to Colossians chapter 1? He says, you could do it however you want to do it. But one thing about it, I am very consistent with what I am begging you. He says, and I'm begging you to walk worthy of the vocation. Your Bible said callings. Okay. Of the callings. Well, read it in the Greek. Of the vocation. Um, the word is too, too much for me to try to pronounce early in the morning. But it's, it's what is that? It is the calling. I believe Paul created this word. I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you, Paul is good at creating words. He didn't want to use them. But he, he uses this word calling quite often. He says, I'm begging you to walk worthy of the calling that you are called. What is he saying? He says in Philippians chapter 3 that we have a high calling. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, that we have a humbling calling. He says uh, that we also have uh, a heavenly calling. Because the Bible study uh, be a little slower. He says you have a high calling, you have a holy calling, you have a humbling calling, but you also have a, a heavenly calling. And he says, based on that, I beg you to walk consistently with the call, the invitation that God, through Christ, has given you in salvation the, the, the invitation, the, the, the salvation that you have. He says that, I try to tell you about it in chapters 1, 2, and 3. You have the earnest of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed. Uh, you, you are loaded. He says, and so I beg you. In light 
of your wealth that you walk. Uh, Vivian, that word walk is the Greek word peripatel. Peripatel. It's a wonderful word. It's a wonderful word. Peri. It's a compound Greek word, peripatel. It's kind of like, you know, we don't have time for it, do we? No. It just, but you know, peri means around. And, and what he's saying is to walk. That, that word walk means the whole of your life, the round of your life, your lifestyle. He says, let your lifestyle and your lips be in balance. I'm tired of y'all. I beg you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called because why, Paul? Why are you so why are you so into this? He says, because the pagans are watching. I beg you, because the world expects there to be a certain characteristic about you. Because there is a certain cause that you are. And it costs. Because God's name is on the line. I beg you. Because God's reputation is on the line. And I tell you what, I don't know what kind of family you grew, in, grew up in, but in the one that I came up in, you didn't play with the family name. No, 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 no. Going to school, I don't care if you had holes in your shoes. I don't care if you had my daddy's cardboard out of his cleaner's shirt. The, the cleaners would put a cardboard in the back of the shirt. When you get it from the cleaner, we tear it up and make some sole for your shoes. Yeah, don't don't hate. Don't, don't look on my glory and try to understand my story. It ain't always been where I had half as many changes of shoes as Dr. Jenny. I never seen nobody with a room for shoes. But I beg you that since God has blessed you that much, I beg you, since God has given you health and strength and has saved you and has raised you, I beg you to walk worthy of that salvation that you have. That when folk, let me, let me hear you, I'm going to go. Um, if, if you got saved and God stamped on your head, watch me. I am a Christian. How would that impact your lifestyle? I know people like where they wear their Sarah shirts and colors in their fraternity uh, alphabets and their Greek, black Greek. They like to wear their Greek stuff. I ain't knocking it. They just didn't invite me. <laughs> they didn't invite me. Uh, I ain't too old, Deacon White, to get in there. Oh, I just remember. I did play at something, and they, they wounded me. And I went to another meeting. Uh, when I see some of the brothers, they all, Rev! I don't know the handshake. I don't know if I get in trouble out on the highway. I don't know what to do. But I know this much. I ain't trying to be identified. But what I am trying to be identified is one who walks balanced. Next time we show up, maybe I'll tell you how to do it. But Paul says, roll that screen for me uh, to the next verse, would you? Because it, it, it tells you, he says, that you got to start out um, uh, with all lowliness and with all humility. That you got to have a proper estimate, est estimation of self. You know what that is? God first, others, and then yourself. Is Paul says, I am more interested in the care of the Christian that's free 
to be joyful and thankful than I am of my own self. Why? Because I dignify my chains that I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus and I'd rather be in Jesus's hands than in any other man's hands in all of these yet to be United States. And when you are no longer clapping, but stepping, you know, I don't know if you, I don't know what it is, but the word that walk is having your lips and your hips singing in the same key. The worthy walk is one of lowliness. The worthy walk is one of humility. The worthy walk is one of forbearance. The worthy walk is one of that. In, oh, that's what he says. You know what it's all about? It's about unity, not uniformity. It's about organic unity. That is, that unity that only God, the Spirit, can give you. That it comes from the inside. Um, it's not organizational unity. I wish you could see how much time is spent fussing over what the wording on the sign should be or how big the table ought to be or who all is going to be at the table. I wish you could see how much time is spent trying to organize and have programs. That's not going to build a church. If you go through the Bible, every time I say this, I hear my preacher friend saying, does everything have to come from the Bible? No, it's already there. And if you are willing to, that's what unity does. Unity honors God. This unity honors the devil. And that's why the devil is always trying to invade the space at your house, at your address. Husband, wife, parents cheering. That's his job. Your and my job is to insist that we are willing to burn the midnight oil, to wear out every garment you have that's got knees. Well, y'all have cut them out already, so I don't know what you're going to do. I, I don't know what, we're in trouble. Is old folk would wear out their clothes so they would go bad. We buy them already bad and pay extra money for them. Got our thighs out, our left cheek is blue and right cheek is every head bowed, every eye closed. That's why he begged. And you don't have to beg Saras to do it. You should hear him talk about uh, 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 what they're going to do. You should hear them talk about it. Y you may know the inside stuff because they won't tell me. They won't even tell me the, the, the secrets. They won't tell me. The, the... Mickey won't tell me. Ernisha won't tell me. But I know they know something because I, I never see people get turned on so with other stuff. But churches, uh, not this way. Uh, I like it on the radio. Uh, I like flipping the different websites. Uh, I could. That is why the apostle begged them. He said, because the world is looking at you. And the world expects there to be a different character about you. And we'll wear a shirt saying, uh, count to 10 before you touch me. We'll wear a shirt with anything on it and a cap too. 
And don't ask me what that means. I don't know. But if God, if we had a t-shirt, la la, get me a t-shirt, say this. Uh, she got a t-shirt queen. She get a t-shirt to say anything. I want one that says, pay attention. A child of God is in your midst. If you want to see, you want to see, you want to see a worthy walk, and you have to be careful because parapetio is not a once and no more. It is ongoing, moment by moment, day by day. You never stop letting your light so shine. Paul will tell them in these last four, in these last three chapters, he'll say, I need you to walk worthy. I need you to walk in purity. I need you to walk in harmony. I need you to walk in victory. I'm all the way in chapter six already, y'all. He says, I need you to walk in light. I need you to walk in love. It's always this walk that he will tell you about because it's all predicated upon your wealth. Father, we thank you for your, your patience. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank you for your purpose in creating us. Lord, make us passionate about knowing you and knowing your purpose for us. Thank you that in this 26th year of celebration, you are bringing us full circle and we are being pleaded with and prodded to cultivate unity because that's only what you expect of us. So, Lord, reveal to us individually how the graces that you have given us and the gifts that you have given us will work together for the glory that belongs to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're so grateful to God that we have in Ephesians 4, Paul's plea for the worthy walk. That's a message for every one of us. How worthy is our walk? How balanced is our walk? There may be some of you here who've never accepted the Lord as your personal savior. You've never confessed him as savior. You never just gave your life to Jesus Christ. And if that's you, we want you to stand just where you are. There may be some of you um, who've joined us on our online platforms who've never accepted the Lord. All you must do is call that phone number and we certainly will talk you through and pray with you and let you know that there's no life greater, better, more enriching than a life in Christ. Secondly, there may be some of you who have accepted the Lord. But you're looking for a church home. The Bible based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace is a perfect place to come to learn the Word of God, to be with imperfect people who are trying to love and grow and know and endeavoring to do those things that are pleasing unto the Lord. So you join with other saints who will be doing the same thing you're doing, learning to love Him and to know Him more. And so if you're looking for a church home, and you're here in the sanctuary, you please stand. 
We certainly would be so grateful to receive you as a part of this family. If you are once again online and you're looking for a church home, just give us a call at that number. And we will do everything that we know to do to connect you with the Bible believing Bible teaching church. I've made two appeals. If you are, look, have you never accepted the Lord as your personal savior? Please stand where you are. If you are looking for a church home, you also please stand. We certainly would love to embrace you and let you know that God is our savior. And there's so much more in a life in Christ. I see none standing. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Rosa, I know you can do better than that. Anybody at all just happy that Paul was begging, begging for uh, us to have a worthy walk. We're so grateful to God for each of you. We can... Um, I'll let you know announcements in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, coming before you, some of you all, as you came in, if you uh, weren't here last week, may have received a uh, sheet that... Um, is endeavoring to grow, know, and to love God more. And it is a ministry gift assessment. Mm -hmm. And so what we would like for you to do is to take this assessment, complete it, fill it out, find out where your gifts are as it relates to ministry, and bring this back with you on April the 28th. We'll be having meeting over in the fellowship um, hall after immediately following our morning service. And it'll be an opportunity for you to get to see the different ministries that we have in the church and to find out how you can use the gifts, the talents, the treasures, your willingness to be able to help the church by knowing what those ministries are and how you can participate. So please, if you didn't receive this package, please raise your hand. We'll make sure that we get one to you. Make sure you fill it out and then make sure you bring it back and participate with us as a part of church anniversary. One of the um, focuses when I first joined Bible-based Church of Temple Terrace was every member in ministry. There was an expectation that every member would be in ministry. And there was this excitement and encouragement about every member being in ministry because once you joined a ministry, you built relationship. Once you joined a ministry, you helped upbuild this community. Once you joined a ministry, you helped us fulfill and realize the vision of this church. And so the way that we're able to go out into the community and help the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the dispossessed is by every member being in ministry. And so understand what your spiritual gifts are and ministry gifts are so that you can use them to walk worthy, so that you can use them for the betterment of the church and honoring God. So thank you for this opportunity to, to announce and Brother Thaxter's holding them up in the rear. Please don't leave here without one of these assessments and remember to bring it back when? April the 28th. Thank you. All right. We have some additional announcements. Want to make sure you take out your phones, take a pen out, make dates. Recordings. Remember that we are celebrating 26 years of ministry in this community. And on April 28th, we will have our 8 a.m. service. We have a guest preacher in the person of um, Pastor Larry Roundtree from mm -hmm. New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. He will be here at 8 a.m. And then, as you just heard, thank you. Let's bless the Lord for him. 
as you just heard um, on the 28th, we'll also have ministry on parades immediately following our 8 a.m. service. But note also on the 27th, on the 27th, say the 27th. 27. That's Saturday. Yeah. That's Saturday. Uh -huh. Saturday. We will be having a prayer walk, which will be sponsored by our... Uh, deacons, prayer ministry, deacons ministry, four men only, ushers ministry, and seniors ministry right here at the church. We want you to come out and um, we want you to wear any Bible-based t-shirt. Um, the announcement says to put on your sneakers and come on out. You know, they don't call them sneakers anymore. They cost so much. I don't call them sneakers anymore. But anyway, put on your sneakers and um, come and celebrate. Um, our anniversary through and, and by this prayer walk. Meet here at the church at uh, 9 a.m. in right here in the sanctuary is where we'll begin. Again, that's on the 27th, 9 a.m. Meet right here in the sanctuary, and we'll have a more full announcement for you next week. We also want to remind you that um, we are still praying. We have a prayer list. We're praying for each of you. We're praying for what um, God to do all that he's doing in and through you and whatever you're facing. We know that God knows all about it, right? And we are keeping you in our prayers. We are, we acknowledged um, birthdays. We didn't have the list, but we'll have the list for you on next week so you can see those names. And we had quite a robust uh, stand up for last week's April birthdays. We never, and, and they, they waving again today. And so let's make sure that we re recognize each other and just continue to love each other. I think I've got all the announcements. Lee, if I'm, am I missing something? All right, good. How many of you were blessed by the word of God? Now you all surprise me every week. You know why you surprise me? Because some of us go to musical concerts and we go to athletic games and we actually even little league games. We go out, we sit in the audience in the yeah. dirt, heat, the sun, right? And when my child, my grandchild, my godchild makes a good run, we jump up and we clap like we ain't never clapped before. But when we say anybody blessed by the word of God, I want you to know that that's good news. That's to be robust and exciting. Because if God were not on our side, we don't know where we'd be, right? So let's just praise the Lord for his word and for what he's doing in us and through us, what we're learning and how we're growing. We are just excited to be his child. Anybody at all blessed by the word of God. Hallelujah. All right, let's get ready to go to uh, our Foundations for Living class, which is over in our fellowship hall. So please do join us. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we thank you so much because you are just that good to us. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you for wealth. We thank you for the riches that your blessings provide in our lives. God, we thank you that we're even coming to know better who we are in you. We thank you that we're coming to know you more, love you more, grow in you more. We thank you, God, for the diligence and the patience. We thank you for looking forward and facing our lives with you in our view. We thank you for light. We thank you for unity. We thank you, Lord, for healing. We thank you for grace. We thank you for power. We thank you certainly for your mercy. And so now, Lord, as we get ready to leave this place, we are asking, Lord, that you just help us to have you and stay on our minds. Help us to acknowledge you in all ways and in everything. Help us, Lord, to pray for all things at all times, in every place, in every circumstance. All because we trust you and we love you. So now, Lord, you do have your way. You have your way in our lives. You have your way in this day. You have your way through and in this church. We're so excited, Lord, that you've united us and joined us together with this 26 years of your presence, of your power, of your work in this community. Energize us, God, so that we might be all that you've made us to be. And Lord, we'll be ever so careful to praise you, to acknowledge you, and to lift you up. It's in the mighty and precious name of Jesus that we pray and all said amen. 
All right, we're getting ready to leave. Those of you who are sitting on the outer aisles, if you face the wall, bring your offerings, the tithes and offerings, because we do know that it all comes from the Lord and it belongs back to him. Those of you in the center aisle, will you go ahead and stand, Miss Linda? You're leading the pack today. <laughs> 